Welcome to Advanced Bait Solutions 2. We're back, and I'm Andy Neal. This time we're going to be travelling to Biodoc Fisheries in Somerset. Shard Reservoir. The mighty River Wye. The beautiful Hartleton Lakes. And lastly, we've come to the bagging mecca that is Cobhouse Fisheries. We've some familiar faces as well as a few new ones to show you the best tackle, tactics and baiting techniques to make sure you get the best out of your fishing. Let's go meet a man regarded by most as the best commercial fishery angler out there, Grant Albert. Well, I'm here at Campbell Lake at Viaduct Fishery, home with some tremendous catches. This man knows it better than most. He's come down and absolutely destroyed some big matches of late. If you want to come to a place and catch some big weights, this is the place to do it. You need big strong gear, big arms and deep nets. When you go about fishing here, you target a couple of different lines. First approach will be shallow fishing. Business end, I use an 861 Turbotina with a lasso. I'm a big fan of lassos, only because when you keep casting and that, you don't come off. You use a band sometimes, it can keep coming off. Right. A carp slap float, the reason I use that is because I can move it up and down the line whenever I want to. There's no shot on the line, right. so if the fish come closer to the surface, I can move my float down. So that's a self cocking float, is it? Self cocking float, mate, okay. obviously, with your bait on the end, depending if it's a pellet or meat, whatever you're using, yep. it'll cock it perfectly. I fish 020 main line with an 018 hook length. Right, okay. Just in case there's a difference. If you get a big fish and you get broke off, you, you know, that's what we use these for. Yeah. Plenty of hook lengths, quick change, back into, back into it again. And you're going to fish that one sort of 13, 14 metres? Yeah, I'll probably start at about 14 today. You, right. know, you, you, you know, when you're fishing a match and you've got bank size presence and everything, it's always best to keep them a bit further out. Mm. Yes, they might go a bit further, but if, you, if they go too far, you pick the waggler up and chuck the waggler over it instead. I noticed you've got a waggler set up. I like floaty floats, I do. They seem to fly a little bit better. Yeah. And I also like weighted floats. Mm. Is that why you've got the, the float stops either side of the...? Yeah, because again, you can move them. Don't yeah. damage your line. Right, Whereas right, right. if you've got shot on your line, yeah. it can affect your line. Sure. So even if you do, you want to use shot, and that's the preference that you want to use, yeah. just slide a little bit of silicon on, and then squeeze your shot onto right, the silicon. Okay. So when you slide, you don't snap. Right. Whereas if you tighten the shot on too much, it could break. Oh. Um, same sort of thing, mate, 018 bottom, or 020, depending on what you're catching. Again, a lasso and an 861 again. These are the new G-Max rods. It's an 11 foot six pellet waggler rod. You pick them up and you think, oh, that's a bit stiff. And I'll tell you something, mate, when you're fishing with them and you hit into a fish, you know, the action is fantastic, mate. They're absolutely oh, brilliant. brilliant. Did you fish any other lines? Yeah, yet? I mean, obviously, we'll, we'll be, be prepared for, for later on in the match. Uh, right. So obviously what we'll do, we'll keep feeding hemp and, and, and meat short, like five sections, six sections. Right, okay. So it's a personal choice, really, depending on how, I like to keep them a little bit further out. Mm. So if you are bagging, you know, you can you can keep them there. Yep. Rather than if you catch them too close, you can spook and play in them all the time. My choice of float today is uh, a Carpa Force. Right. I also use uh, Garbolino DC 17s. They're right. cracking float as well. Main line 020. Okay. Hook length 018. Same again. You're Same right. again. Okay. Different shot and pattern today. I've got a bulk and one dropper. Dead depth. Is Dead it? depth on the bottom. Yeah. Right. Uh, short and I'll be fishing meat. Uh, depending on the size of your. Um, I mean, I use a, this is a 175 mm -hmm. number four. Quite a long hook length on here today, but you can use shorter. And if I'd have had a shorter hook length on, personal choice again, I'd have had all my bulk together. Right. But as it's a bit longer hook length, I've got bulk and one dropper. Right, okay. And strong elastics as well to match? Not set too, uh, too tough. It's, it just comes out nice, obviously, on a puller bung. I mean, that's not too tight. No, now. that's, I mean, I just want to touch on that quickly. People get misconceived ideas that they've got to use super strong elastic, and it's not the way forward, is it? No. I mean, I've never been a big elastic person anyway, even when, you know, before these came about. Yeah. Um, I like to hook a fish. It's like when you're fishing shallow, you don't want to fish too heavy. Yeah. The reason is, because when you hook one, you want it to go down in your peg and pull it out your peg. Right. And then keep feeding over the top. Yeah. And keep them interested. Mm. If you've got something that's really tight and you can't even pull it out your pole, they're going to go, as soon as you walk them, they're going to go mad in your peg. Yeah. And all the fish that are there then, you're going to spook mm. them away. Everyone knows me for fishing meat, and I'm confident at it, mm. you know, and I know I can catch big weights on it. Yeah. Looks like a fairly simple bait list to me. Booty today. Right. And probably pull only on the hook. Okay. Obviously on our short line later on, we're going to put hemp in. The hemp and meat together are deadly, aren't they? Cracking. I, I mean, I love it. I'm a massive fan of it. Hemp's a great base for carp to come over and just hoover up with your nice piece of meat sitting there. It initially just drags loads of fish into the swim, yeah, does it? Yeah, it's the oils and, and the stuff off the hemp, especially in the smell. Um, and then you've got the soft texture of the meat, yeah. which they just seem to love. 
Boosty's got a lot of amino acids in it and, and, and betaine and things like that. It's really potent. I mean, it's cracking. It's a crack. Caught some big fish on that. Well, I've, I've got to be honest, Stephen, I've caught a few using that, so I, I, I know how effective it can be. Okay, well, I'm going to use a 7mm cutter today. Well, the good thing about a 7mm is it depends on the size of the hook you're using. You can put two pieces on. I can feed it short and I can fire it long from my pellet waggler right. and I can feed it long from my pole as well. Right, okay. So it's so a perfect size. One size covers everything. I'll just quickly show you how simple and easy it is to cut this meat up in this meat cutter. When it is out in the sun, it does go a little bit softer, doesn't it? You it mentioned does, mate. Keep, keeping it in the fridge. If you're going to cut it up the night before you go, yeah. keep it in the fridge and then ideally keep it in a cool bag. Yeah, and then when it's on your bank, make sure you keep a towel over it. Keeps all the freshness and goodness into it. So many people, when I go around the fisheries, you see people we're sitting on the tray, it's burnt. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's it's not good. All the flavour's gone then. A few minutes to open the can, put it in there. Ready to go? Ready to go, mate. You come down here and catch 200 pounds in a match. Yeah. Ridiculous weights. And yeah. you'll do that on what, three or four tins Three or four meat? tins, depends. You might need a bit more sometimes, depends on the venue, depends on the type of match you're fishing. Mm. But generally, if you're just going pleasure fishing, two to three tins, absolutely fantastic. You can have a cracker day fishing. I mean, look at that. As soon as you open it, look at the juices that are in there. You can smell it. You can you smell how strong yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Right, let's show you how to do this. Pretty simple. Push the plunge Push down. Push it down. Just goes through the one way. Just keep it on the side. Push it again. You know, the, all the juice that's in there, just get it all involved. Yeah. But look at the difference in the colour. This one, for a hook bait, I don't think you can go far wrong. Hmm. You know, when, you, when you're fishing shallow, they're snatching at it anyway, so this one would be better for that. On the bottom, hook bait, hair rigging, whatever you're doing, polony every time. Mm. That. It's got to be like a magnet to Absolutely, fish. Absolutely, mate. If that, you can't catch fish on that, there's something wrong. Right. So we're going to put some hemp in, feed a bit of this over the top. I wouldn't put that in with the hemp. I'll keep the hemp separate, and then what I should do is add a few. If you put too much meat in, it takes them longer to find your bait. Yeah, yeah. More hemp, less meat. More fish. You see lots of other hemp on the market. Mm. It's not as big as this. I'm looking at the size of that. I keep using a lot of it, mate. I mean, I use a lot. The oils and everything else that comes off it is in the can. Right. You know what I mean? That's why it makes it so great. We're fishing for car, yeah. and they're just greedy, you know yeah. what I mean? So they're going to come in, nice big bed of that on the bottom with your meat, get them confident, and then start slaying them. Someone said to me once, if I was a fish, I was going to be the biggest in the lake. Didn't quite know how to take that. No. One common problem a lot of people have is not knowing how much feed to put in at the start of the session, whether it be a match or a pleasure session. Obviously, Grant's a master at this. I'm not going to feed my short line with a pot. I'm going to just loose feed, and then later on in the match, then we'll start putting it in properly. I'm going to put that much hemp in, a good half a pot there, mate, yeah. of a big pot, and I want to put a few grains of meat in. Maybe just tip it off with a bit more. And we're going to put that long, right. and then I want to fish shallow over the top of it. So initially, we're going to get the fish there, we're going to feed over the top and we're going to bring them up. When I'm fishing it long like this, I don't put it in like everybody else. People look at me as if I'm going a bit mad. I like to bounce the pole I do, make a nice big area. I don't know if you can see that. Right, right, right. right. Okay, so, so initially it's making a nice sound on the top, so they, them fish might want to come up straight away anyway. You see the oil slick on the water as well? Yeah, that flat That's patch. all off the hemp, that is. We're going to go straight over the top of that now with a the, with the shallow rig. We are. We've got a little band on there. I'm going to put a piece of meat, I'm going to push that. Through there, yep. stay at the other end, pull it into the meat, pull that into the meat. That's ready to go. So what's your starting depth, Grant? If you go too deep, you start foul looking them. So I always like to start off a little bit shallower and work my way down. Get to know the venue and you'll get to know how far yeah. and how deep they are, do you know what I mean? You can see one, one pot full of bait, they're in and fizzing over yeah, it already. Look at that. Already, mate, yeah. just, just little and often, just keep flicking your rig over like that as well. All the noise, the better. So obviously the noise of the bait going in and what have you, it's just drawing more fish into the area, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's all it is, mate, yeah. Right. You just feed four or five bits of bait. There you go, straight away, look at that. That is literally straight away, mate. That's incredible, Right, so it's come out your peg, a few more bits of meat, straight back in your swim, and then so start shipping back. So there's nothing hurried about that, was it? That, that no, fish no. grabbed the bait, off it went. Yeah. Just draw the fish out of the swim. Yeah, that's important. Feed a bit more, take your time. Yeah, take him, you want him out your swim. So any more fish that are in there, you, wanna, you don't want to disturb them, you see. Hmm. Right, get him halfway back, catapult. No rush, mate. So that's why these light elastics are so good yeah. now, isn't it? Feed a bit more. Just keep some interest in what, you know, while you're playing these fish. You see people you know, trying to horse these fish in and really pull them too hard, don't you? There's, yeah. there's just no need. Every fish counts, mate. You know, one fish cost me 
you know, a considerable amount of money. So just take your time. There you go. Easy as that, eh? Easy as that, mate. <laughs> Simple as that. Not getting any easier than that, mate. <laughs> Put your bait on before you go back out again, feed. You've got to keep that feed going in, mate. You're seriously quick. Just get yourself ready. A few more bits of meat. Back out. So they're ready now. They're looking for bait now, them fish. Later on in the match, you're going to be fishing shorter. So what we do, four, between four and ten pieces, mate, you know, and just throw them in. You know where you're fishing, make sure you're, you're chucking it on the same line. Yeah. And just do that every five or ten minutes, just keep them occupied. And just all you're doing is priming it for later on, basically, isn't it? The loose offerings that you're throwing in are going to get eaten pretty quick. Yeah. So you want a nice bed there, so come like two and a half hours to go with the match, I'll start putting hemp in them, so you can keep them there rather than swimming around, trying to look for your bait and then go in. There's a nice bed of bait there for them. They'll stay there then. My good friend Lee Werrett's been fishing here for a few years now with some astounding results. He's been fishing through the summer months with paste, both on the straight lead and on the pole. You've got your paste as your hook bait and then some feed pellets. They come in two, four, six and eight mils. What size did you normally bring here? Mostly just eights and sixes. Eights for feeding on the bomb when I'm using the conker with the paste wrapped around the pellet. Generally sixes on the pole line with the softer paste. One of your favourite types of paste is actually the special G Gold, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Sometimes you don't even have to feed any pellets with it. Once you start catching with it, the fish will just come back to it time and time again. It's such a very cheap way of, of mixing a paste. Now that bag would probably last me four or maybe five matches. As hook bait for paste? As hook bait for paste. Right. And perhaps a few loose offerings as well. That's very, very good. Probably for money, I mm. think. Yeah, without you know, especially when, you, when you're catching a lot of fish on a bag of paste yeah. in four or five matches. And when you're looking at a place like this, where you can catch two, three hundred pounds mm. on less than two pints mm. of paste, and it has to be mixed right. Firstly, one pint of water. Now, I'm just going to stop you there because you're doing everything that what seems to me to be the wrong way around. Obviously, when we mix ground bait, you've got to add water a little bit at a time yeah. to achieve the right consistency. That's right. And we all know that how good a, a ground bait special G Gold is. Right. But now you're going to add that to water. The way I do it, it ensures the water is absorbed all the way through the mix. Right. Okay. If you put the powder in first yeah. and try to add the water dead after, and you're mixing it, yeah. and, the, and the powder is still at the bottom of the bait box, it takes less than two minutes to mix. I use Super Soak CSL. Yeah. That's right. the only additive I use. Just a very small amount. And like literally, that's all you need. Give it a little twirl around, so now you see the colour of the water's changed completely. It's taken a lot of trial error to get to this stage, but it's worth it. So you're passing on all your little secrets here, then, are you? Well, time served, isn't it? One, two. Well, that looks awful, doesn't it, at the minute? Yeah. So you just mix it in nice and slowly. You can use your hands. I use a fork. Just, just in case you get hungry? Well, not just that. <laughs> but it keeps everything nice and clean, doesn't it? You can already see the consistency changing. There's absolutely no powder in there whatsoever now, right? It's an even consistency right. all the way through. The water's it? got right through it. That's exactly all I do. I can guarantee by the start of the match, that will be absolutely perfect. And that's purely because all the particles in the ground bait sucked up all the water yeah. and it stiffened slightly. Yeah. So let's have a little look now and see how you mix the carp paste, because that, that differs, doesn't it? It certainly does. It comes in two flavours. Natural fish meal and halibut. Once it's mixed and the gluten comes into, into effect, it's very, very stringy. Right, okay. It sticks to the pellet like the proverbial. Our mix is totally different. It's like porridge. Little bits of pieces in it. It's full of fish meals. Yeah. And... We don't add any additives to this at all. Okay. And we do this like we do with ground bait. Little by little. Try to get your fingers in with this one. It all mixes up lovely, this. All right. You can see it's starting to stick together already. Like, like the old paste mixes where you just kept adding water. So now it's all going very sticky and hard. If I wanted to use this on the pole, I could. But I just add a lot more water to it. Basically for just wrapping around the pellet. And you see how stringy that's getting already. You see it all sticking together? Yeah. I've messed about with that far, far more than 
I've messed about with that at all. Yeah. You saw how easy that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just the same. That's what you got. That will last you five dollars. The texture of that is. It's absolutely superb. Yeah, that'll get wrapped around the pellet and that'll, oh. that'll stay on for a long time. You could turf that out 80 yards if you wanted to and it yeah. wouldn't come off. We can see the difference in the two baits. Yeah. Same name, completely different uses. Mm. You can see the texture of the two. Very soft, almost putty like. Can't run your finger through that. Yeah. Breaks up, very, very lumpy, but that's the texture you're trying to achieve. So you've got your hook bait sorted. I've got a bag of pellets. Let's have a look at your rigs. This rig is responsible for quite a lot of match wins. 022 mainline, all the way through to a size 12 hook. A very strong hook. Mm. No hook length. Right. No weak spots at all. All right. So if this is a brutal style of fishing. This then. is brutal fishing. 4x16 float, shot under the float. Very, very important. Why is that then? Right. It helps the cock, semi cock the float. Uh -huh. Also acts as a marker. If you're playing a fish and your float moves, that very rarely moves. Tips a lot longer than I've seen on a lot of other patterns. With pace fishing, you get so many fish in your swim. But if you try to fish an ordinary short bristle, which would generally be sort of yeah. that length, yeah, yeah. then it, it would be useless. It'd be under the water so most of the time. You'd be getting line bites. The time and... Fish brushing against the float, they'd be pulling the float under the water. Your float would move, you'd pull the paste off. I generally have all of the bristles showing above the water on a tight line with a plummet on the bottom. That I found is the optimum depth to fish over depth. Three number eights. Do you notice how far they are away from the hook? Yeah. Around about 18 inches to two foot. Now the reason for that being is fish mooching about on the bottom, they move your shot, they brush against your shot, they'll spook off. Right, okay. With it being, with it being high up in the, in the rig itself, yeah. sort of this, this far off the deck, mm -hmm. it's very unlikely to come into contact with the fish. Is that float shotted to capacity? No, it's half shotted. If the paste isn't on, that the float, float will, will pop up. Will pop up completely out of the water. All right. The only reason it can come up is because it's either come off or a fish has picked that bait up off the bottom. What's the cup for? It's for transporting your paste into the swim. Oh, so it's not for feeding as such? Well, you can put pellets in it if you want to, but generally, all my feeding with paste fishing is done with a catapult. Now, that might go against the grain with a lot of people, but if you try to feed on a six-punch paste fishing, it's just a recipe for disaster. Because you're going to get liners. You're and... just going to get a lot of liners. <coughs> I would much rather have the bait go over a certain area, maybe even six to eight foot mm. in diameter. Those fish can come in and graze confidently over that bait. They come in, they see the lump of paste, ball up, you're on. We're using paste, it's very, very soft. Watch what happens when I put the piece of paste on the hook and try to push it out over the water. People will ask me why only fall off when it's in the water. The water actually cradles it to the bottom. As we pull a piece off, marble size, like I say, look at my hands, but the carp love it. We just flatten it slightly, we put the hook on the top, press our thumb into it, fold it over, the hook is totally covered, and we put it in the pot. If I told you that would stay on in 10, 12 foot of water, some people would laugh, but believe me, it will. Because that's because all the particles in the special G exactly. have fully absorbed all the water. Exactly. Them. See, from the bomb rig you've got here, simple standard rig for fishing these commercials. Yep. Eight pound mainline, to a quick change bead, an old 22 hook length to a size 12 hook. This hook is going to be on the bottom. It's going to be encased in a lump of paste. Why use a small hook? I notice you've here rigged a band on this one. Yeah, and it also gives you that confidence under the rod tip when you've got a bigger hook on. You notice I'm using an, an ounce bomb. Yeah, that's quite heavy. Because if I tried to use a lighter bomb and try to cast the pellet with the paste wrapped around it, it wouldn't get it because the paste would be heavier than a half ounce bomb. Right, so it's going to loop then, isn't it's it? Going in to the loop. So you want a heavy bomb yeah to literally drag the paste yes. out behind it. What I'm actually doing is I'm casting the weight of the bomb. And not the weight of the paste. And not the weight of the paste. Nice gap between the pellet and the hook. You can wrap it around if you want to, if you're missing bites. Or even I've got a longer hook length, way longer. We're gonna put some paste around there. It's quite tough, okay? So you can be a little bit more aggressive, uh, aggressive with it, yeah? yeah? We pull a piece off. Again, marble size, slightly bigger. We lay the pellet on the top of it. Press the pellet and the hook into the paste. Just fold it around it to make it aerodynamic. Don't try to make it into a ball. You're almost making it sort of lemony shape. So when that gets cast out now, that's going to sit on the bottom and start literally melting and unfolding around that pellet, that's giving right. off loads of attractors in the water column. That's right. It's going to draw the fish in and hopefully give you an instant hit. Yes. That's as simple as it is.
second cast, I've had a massive liner on the first cast. It's absolutely mullered off the rest. And we're attached to something quite angry here. Maybe only be eight or 10 pound, but good God, they fight. It's a take no prisoners. Uh, you can see why people don't quite get it right here when they come here, mate. It's come right into my bank. That's the beauty of these short rods. When they do come up, they come up right in front of you. There's so much power, it's, it's incredible. It's so fit. And we're not using Mambi Pambi gear here. And that's only the second piece of paste I put out there. You know, I'm not putting any pressure on the fish at all, I'm just holding on, literally. I'm not bullying the fish in any shape or form. I'm just holding on for dear life. It's important that you land every fish. I mean, look at the size of that thing there. I mean, it's no wonder it's for as a big common. Well done, mate. Thank you, mate. Fishing five minutes and you're straight away. I mean, that's... Oh. 10, 11 pound of muscle. You know, what a great start to the day, like. Yeah, he's beating you up for your trouble as well. When you talk to fish of that size, it doesn't take long to build a weight. 10 of those will see you have 100 pound easily, Andy. Oh yeah, for sure. fish have started to back away from that shallow pole line now. He's caught quite a few. So, time for the waggler, I think, mate. Let's just have a look. Those odd bits that have been going past the pole line have been priming that line for a while now, haven't they? Yeah. If you don't get a boat straight away, you've got to work. This is the thing with this waggler, you've got to work it. You've got to find the depth that they're at. You've got to keep casting. No good just leaving it there. You've got to make it work. Generally, when they're there, Andy, he hits the water and he's off the rest. Yeah. Just like that. As easy as that? As easy as that, yeah. You know, when we're playing a fish, you've got to try and feed at the same time, exactly the same as we would do it on a pole. Hold it on my leg, put just a few cubes in, because obviously it's a bit more difficult now. Still feed. Got to keep them interested out there. So as predicted, mate, two casts and you've hooked another fish? Yeah. And there we go, in the net. And that, that was on a cube of the Poloni, was it? Poloni, mate, mate, yeah. I've been firing the boosty ones out and fishing the Poloni ones on the, on the up, mate. I've been feeding that short line all day now and I'm itching to get on it. You're going to kick this off with a, a big pot of hemp and a few cubes of Poloni just to make sure they're down on the deck where you want them? Yeah, because I've been noticed a few of them are swirling, you see, so oh, you keep loose feeding, they will come up in the water, so we'll put some hemp down, get them down. I'm just going to cup it in. I'm not going to make any noise, so I want them to get them on the deck, so I'm just going to lower that in and hopefully that gets right to the bottom and the fish will follow it down. Fantastic. Lovely summer's weather's come back to join us, mate. It's been on and off all day, hasn't it? Yeah, terrible. So I'll put two pieces of polonia, two sevens. There's a little bit of fizzing going on there. My word. So I think there might be one or two there. <laughs> they absolutely home in on that polonia, don't they? Yeah. It's just so pungent. Look at that. I've, I've just, I'm just, just literally lowering that in. Something's Rather than off, let yeah. it go out and try, and you might foul look one. Yeah. And as it's gone in, it just, grabbed all of it. This is where you do your damage in the last two hours of the match. They tend to be bigger fish as well, you see. I don't know why, but then big fish, in most venues you go to. But I mean, I know from experience on this lake, and I've caught them up to 15 pounds, late on, over a bed of them. It's devastating, mate. And all of that on a few tins of poloni, boosted meat, and a tin of emp. Yeah. Incredible fishing. Yeah. You, you're that practiced at it now that you, you can get these fish in relatively quick. Yeah. If you're fishing a match, you've got to get them in a little bit quicker. Generally, you, you know, you don't need to bully them, because more often than not, you'll pull out of them. Yeah, and another one. I can't believe that actually took as you were lowering your rigging. I know, yeah, and it's, it's in the mouth as well. It's not foul looked either, yeah. so. That's right down its throat, that. Oosh. <laughs> I'm putting him back. You've caught a few on the pace then? Oh, mate, it's been absolutely tremendous. Oh, there's some big fish there, oh, mate. Mate, I tell you. Look at those. Absolutely incredible. Superb. I mean, look at those, uh, those beasts. They certainly set pesky tackle, don't they? Don't they just? Look at them. What a fish we've made. Well done. Thank you, mate. Well done, mate. What a lovely day. Even a brummy can catch a few here. Yeah, even a brummy can catch a few here, mate. What a day's fishing, unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. A few tins of meat, a couple of tins of super seed hemp. 
and you've just caught fish on everything you've done. It was just fantastic, mate. I had a conversation with my good friend Steve Tucker about this place, Chard Reservoir. Steve's been fishing here for a number of years now and doing exceptionally well. The reputation of this place speaks for itself, so the invitation is one I couldn't miss. I'm going to give Steve a bit of a lesson at his own game, hopefully. He's going to fish an open-end feeder, traditional bream tactics, ground baits, worms, a few pellets possibly. Me, I'm a little bit different to that. I've come down to give him the, the lesson in the new school. I'm going to fish a method. I'm absolutely convinced I can beat him on it. Let's get it on. Now the ground bait that both myself and Steve have chosen to use is the Omen. It's become a phenomenon in bream fishing throughout the last year, year and a half. A lot of very, very good anglers throughout the country are recording some huge, huge catches with it. And we put that down to some of the, the new flavours and new ingredients. It's not a sweet mix, but it's certainly not a fish meal mix. Very different to your normal ground bait. We've got two kilo bag here, that's more than enough for a session. Now we know from fishing our commercial waters that Bream absolutely love pellets. Don't tell Steve this because he doesn't know yet. I brought myself a bag of two mil special G green pellets. So the other thing I brought with me as a feed bait are the two mil premium pellets. Super high quality. I brought some four mils and six mils with me for change hook baits and also if we do get the fish lined up I can really start introducing a lot. Pop them in a box, cover them with water for one minute, drain them off and leave them. 10 minutes later, you have a perfect spongy pellet that you can wrap around a method feeder on its own or mix it again with the Omen to put around your method. Now, as I'm fishing a method feeder, hook baits become super important. Bream love meat, they love sweet corn, and they especially love these things. Lots of boilies get fed in waters all over the country these days with carp anglers, and Bream are now eating them in their droves. I will never, ever go anywhere without a tin of enticed meat. This stuff is absolutely brilliant and has caught me fish everywhere I go. We've got the new Bait Tech Sweet Corn, handy pack tins, and lastly, but certainly by no means least, I've got a tub of mixed halibut marine pellets. Now these are always handy to have in your bag. Before we get our gear out, I'm gonna mix some ground bait. Don't put too much water in. To get the perfect mix, it's little and often basis. We'll get our hands in. Give it a good mix. Instantly, as soon as that water starts reacting with the ground bait, you can smell the garlic and herbs and all the rest of the aromas that are absolutely permeating through the air now. We've gone from a dry consistency to one I can squeeze into a ball with ease. But the way to test to make sure you've got the right consistency, put it between your palms and give it a rub and it should break down perfectly into the crumb-like state that you've got in your bucket. Let's go and have a look at Steve's setup. This Omen grain bait, I've used it now for about two and a half years. I won the league here last year using it, and I'm winning the league this year using it. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm fishing it through an open end feeder. Just gauge how the fish want it on the day. Sometimes they rather have a bit more pellet and a bit more corn. I'm basing my approach around method feeder with boilies, pellets, etc. But you're using it with worms and casters, so it's a really versatile mix that you can use in, in any which way you want. Yeah, I've also used it for method fishing and everything. I've absolutely caught shed loads of skimmers on it. It's, right. like say, right. it's my favourite skimmer growing bait by a country mile. You've got some chopped worm there. Oh, I see. You've sneaked a few pellets on your table as well. No. Well, I couldn't let you have all the glory. Yeah, so that I sounds about right. A few. That's the uh, two mil bream love them. You just softened a few of those up. Yeah, sometimes the bream prefer pellets and they do natural bait, so obviously I always carry a few on my tray just in case. Oh, well. uh, that old chestnut. Got some floating maggots. That is traditional, isn't it? That's, That's traditional. traditional as it comes. Yeah, they've got some casters. Uh, we've got some white squats. Oh. Dendrous. Proper red worms. As typical as a, a side tray for bream fishing as I think you're ever going to see, really. Let's, let's have a little look at your rigs, because obviously my rigs are completely different. First of all, we got your main lines coming down through through obviously through your rods. Three pound Drennan Suplex line. Right, okay. And I've got a shock leader of 018 on it. Right, okay. So just to give, just to give you the comfort for when you're banging that yeah. feeder out. And also gives me thin line diameter. So, so bite registration is better. Bite registration is better and it doesn't pick the toe up. What have you got there? It's mate? a Garbolino Super G 12 foot feeder. 
It's absolutely fantastic, as you can see. The top top sections of it, it's very, very soft, which is obviously what you need for bringing mm. skimmer fishing. But also, the power in the middle gives me great casting ability, and obviously the bully fish if I need need to, if they're in snags and stuff like that. Yeah. We've got quite a long Paternoster there with a, a conventional open end feeder. Why do you use such a long Paternoster? Um, what I always do is double up the last bit of line, like six inches, entire entire loop, so you're left with six inches of line. Yeah. And then I attach the feeder so it sits on the bottom of that six inch line, right. which obviously gives me an extra little bit of um, forgiveness here mm. with the double double the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also it makes it very stiff, so it keeps it away from the hook length. Right. Okay. So you're actually in effect trying to kick your hook length out away yeah. from it, keep it straight. I find this way the best way of doing it. Then also, all I do then is I got my hook length with a loop on. Yeah. I feed the line through the loop, feed it over the feeder. Okay. So it goes up to the main line. So you've got a loop closing on itself, yeah. basically, right? And I thread it up the main line. And then, as you can see, the actual loop just sits on that knot. Ah, uh, yeah, I can just slide it down yeah. and it butts up against yeah, that it's knot. knot. And I okay. find that being the best way. I've used it for probably 10 years and I haven't found a better way of fishing. Okay, so you've got another rod set up. Exactly the same as this one. So it's still another Garbolino 12 foot. Yeah. But on this one, um, I always have a, a separate hook length done up for, for this, for, for hair rig, like double corn. And also I can use the um, halibut pellets, which is pre-drilled as well. You're just about to start fishing. How much bait do you put in? It depends on the venue, really. And obviously, you, you cannot say. Sometimes I like to put in quite a few feeder fools, probably 10 or 12 big feeder fools. And by, by that, you mean the... Yeah, I use always use these to start with, to put in the all the food out to start. These are the Garbolino long distance feeders. They castrate and you can get through quite a few bit of bait using that. You can go to bream venues and some days they want an absolute load of bait. A bit of omen. Yeah. So what have you done there? You've just plugged just, the bottom just end. Just plugged the bottom end. Okay. Then I'll see. A bit of worm. Okay. A few casters. Pinch of casters. Then, then more the, omen on the more end. More omen on the end. Packs it out, and there you are, ready to go. I've clipped up both both rods and reels. I've got the same reels on. I chucked it out to 45 turns, so right. obviously both are exactly the same distance. I wish you all the best, mate. I'm going to go and have a fish. And you, mate. Okay, so we've seen Steve's methods and his baits. Now let's have a little look at mine. I've got a 12 foot Frenzy Precision Medium feeder rod. Absolutely purpose built for days like this. It's got a beautiful soft tip running into a medium action and then a lot of power in mid to butt sections. Absolutely ideal when you're punching feeders a long way. I'm fishing a method feeder, which is free running. I've got one number four shot there. That just helps pin the line to the bottom away from the feeder to stop any chance of any line bites and then we've got a simple method feeder on there running through to a quick change bead and a four inch hook length with a hair rig spike. A 4000 size reel, I've got eight pound main line which might sound quite heavy. Uh, the reason I'm using eight pound is so I can really punch it if I need to. I'm fishing 50 turns. Uh, if I need to go any further, I know I can with this setup. This line also, this particular line sinks really, really quickly, which is ideal. I've got an identical setup. I've clipped it up at exactly the same distance, but just in case these fish do want to feed, I'm going to put the big boy on, which is going to enable me to get a lot of feed in very, very quickly, which I can then put my method feeder over the top. A mixed omen with a green special G pellets through it. The fish home in and start eating these and they'll sweep through the peg and stay there until they've hunted down every last one. Brilliant addition to any ground bait. The rest of the bag there that I've softened up, I can actually squeeze those around a method feeder should I want to. We've got premium two mil pellets. Then quite simply, it's down to my hook baits. Steve's already fishing and I'm not wasting any more time. What a beautiful day out. <laughs> we'll be all right, we'll catch a few. Well, Steve might not, but I will. Not with that cast in, you won't. Don't lose it. Oh, you haven't lost it. Oh, mate, it's not gone in a snag. 
<laughs> That's devastating. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. First blood to the method, my friend. Early days, early days. Ho ho! Shame you lost that one earlier, mate. Don't lose it, mate. Oh, that's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> one nil for the pellet. I never like catching first, it's bad luck. Method feeder strikes again. At this point, you might notice that Steve is very quiet. We've had some nasty showers, but this low cloud and slight ripple is actually good bream fishing weather. Oh, it's a beautiful fish. Typical big dark bream. Another one for the method. Mwah. Finally up one, Steve. Is this the comeback? Just a matter of time. I'm there. Ho oh, ho, we're on. Lovely fish, look at that, Andy. Very nice fish, mate. The traditional baits are starting to pull back. So you've had one lucky fish, that's all it is. You see a lot of people fishing a method these days with the rod sat across their knee. That's fine if you're busy, you're casting every couple of minutes and you're catching fish very regularly. This sort of situation where you're actually having to wait for bites, put it on a rest, off your knee, out the way. Very, very important that you let the feeder break down, let the bait develop and let the fish actually come and find the bait. Stevie, this Too is more late. like it, son. Cool. Oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> you watch you don't knock that off. Fantastic, mate, isn't it? He's in there. What a beauty. Look at that one. That's the biggest. Look at that. <laughs> you reckon to that then? Great light. Ed. <laughs> what a day. What a day. Tremendous, mate. What? Method feeder versus cage feeder. What an unbelievable day sport. All on omen. I think we're going to have to call it a draw because we both have the same number of fish. But when you've got fishing like this, there's no competition. It's just great. What a great stamp of fish it is. I hope you enjoyed it here, mate, on my venue. Brilliant, mate. I'll certainly be back, that's for sure. What a fantastic day. Let's, Let's get them home, shall we? Yeah. Look at them. We come to the gorgeous Hartleton Lakes to hopefully catch some skimmers. We've got Bait Tech superstar Ian Didcott. This is really a true love, isn't it? Catching big weights of skimmers. There's a few matches on here that we can get to fish, but if you come here and pleasure fish and stuff, you can absolutely fill your boots. What's the plan of attack for today? We've got two feeder rods set up, fishing down the same hole, slightly different presentation. A waggler rod fishing over the top of the same line, um, and uh, two pole lines. We've got. A normal little cage feeder there, a short four inch link to a little fixed pattern oster yet. A reasonably large hook, but we're just going to be fishing a bunch of maggots or a, a big expander on there, something like that, or a piece yep. of corn. It's on a reasonably soft rod, they're soft mouth fish, don't want to pull the hooks out. A lighter tip in there as well because you're fishing for bites. Unfortunately, with the method feeder, they you know, hook themselves, yeah, they against, hook themselves the against the feeder. Four and a half pound line on there, nice light nice, reel. Gentle. Got another method feeder rod set up, which is similar. All it is is just a rod with a clip on the end so I can change feeders quickly. Yep. And all I'm going to do is fish a tiny little flatbed method feeder on there, little tiny bit of extra lead on the back. I've changed the uh, elastic inside the feeder, so it's actually a short length of six to 10 hollow, right, which okay. is a little bit more forgiving, playing the fish in. You want to keep the elastic stretched virtually all the time. Short hook length, a small hook fishing double maggot on. Got a, a waggler rod set up as well. All I'm gonna do is, as I'm fishing the feeder, I'm just gonna every now and then ping sort of 10, six mil pellets and get a bit of an area going. Mm -hmm. You have a quick chuck on the waggler and you can pick up a few fish which are just dotted around and not coming actually to the ground bait. And I see you've got your pole set up at quite a long length. So I'm going to fish one line at 14 and a half metres, which is just going to fish on the bottom, potting in pellets to start with and then loose feeding a few pellets over the top. Just four mils and fishing like six mil expanders or hard pellets on the hook, depending right, on how okay. the roach are. And then I've got another line set up for fishing 13 metres down to my left towards the reeds there. 
where I'm going to feed with fours and micros and the bait tech tutti fruity sweet corn. Just trying to catch a tench or a, a few big bream. Like so on. a couple of bonus fish like yeah. The bait you've brought with you in front of us here, uh, noticeably it's all pellets and fish meal. I know this lake quite well and um, if you put normal bait in here like maggots and sweet mix, uh, ground bait mix in here, just catch roach all day. Um, a lot of people come carp fishing on here and you know a lot of pleasure anglers come on here. The skimmers and the tench and everything like that are all, They're all eating. clued on to pellets. Pellets, pellets, pellets. Fish meal ground bait, expanders, normal pellets. You can even catch on boilers, little mini boilers on method feeders and stuff like that. Two of your favourite ground baits here, me, Special G Gold and Special G Green. To coin a phrase, I do catch a lot of fish on them. It brings confidence to your fishing in that. It must be something in the ground bait which actually Didn't turns you? a fish on, but then it doesn't just turn them on and then lets them go again. It keeps them in the peg and yeah. keeps them rooting around and it's crazy. What are you going to be feeding on that waggler line because it's quite a distance isn't it? Yeah basically I'm just going to fish like six mil pellets, fish and feed these. So that's all you're going to use? Yeah. In conjunction with uh, the ground bait I'm going to fish around the method and through the little right. open end feeder and stuff. Okay. Those are just going to be pinged over the top and then fished on the hook as well. What have we got the sweet corn for? Um, tench. Okay. And great big bream. Lots of people bring normal corn mm. but you know normal corn sort of gone a little bit now so you've got to just step up and find yourself an edge yeah you know just, which is why i bring like the tutti fruity and the scope x and that mix a little bit of it together yeah. you know make, make the fish keep guessing and stuff i noticed you've got a bag of two mil micros here and obviously the ground bait are, are you going to combine these if i'm getting regular quick bites on the method just putting ground bait through i should start introducing a few micros into the mix as well and if it keeps getting better and better i should just start putting more and more micros in right okay just to try and hold the fish a bit yeah. longer in the peck yeah. going to knock up a 50 50 mix a half a bag of each ground bait it's majorly important that you've got to blend all the like the dry ingredients together before you actually add any water like there's no yeah. patches in it it's all even yeah. after using ground bait for so many years I, I pretty much know virtually what it's going to take I mean, yeah, it's, it's completely te changed texture changed texture it's, it's coming together quite nicely like you can squeeze a ball out of it and then the board dissipates quite quickly when you rub it through your hands. That needs to rest for 10 minutes. Mm. We need to pump some expanders. One of the best fish catches out there are without doubt the Bait Tech Expand Pellets. Available in 2, 4 and 6 mil, these are the ones to be using. Preparing expanders really couldn't be easier, but I do see a lot of people getting it wrong. Let's quickly show you how I do it to make sure you get the perfect expander every time. A pellet pump, fill with water, take a bag, a Bait Tech Expands. I'm going to do some 6 mils for you now. You don't need many for a session. A small handful will see you through, unless, of course, you wanted to feed them. They all float now. This is why we pump them. Put the lid on and start pumping. So you're sucking all of the air out of the pellet and pulling all of the water into the pellet. It helps the pellet expand, fill full of water, take on water and absorb it all so it sinks nice and slowly in the water. So we'll keep pumping and then release. So they've all sunk, drain off some of that water. I'm going to leave the pellets in enough water so they're just covered. Put those aside for five to 10 minutes. They'll be absolutely perfect and ready to fish with. And in true Blue Peter fashion, here's some I've made earlier. There we have some four mil and six mil expand pellets ready for action. As you can see, they've taken on all the water. They're nice and soft and fish of every species absolutely love them. Go back to the ground bait, have a look at this. Have a little uh, stir around, check your consistency. You can see now, it still, still yeah. like folds into a ball, but it's a little... But it has dried out ever so slightly. It is dried out because you can like Yeah, that's just crumbling, crumbling quite yeah. easily, isn't it? A tiny little sprinkle of water. So, so tiny if, amount tiny of bit, time. You can always put a bit more in. Just check that. See, that's one, one squeeze there, yeah. and that's together. Put it for a riddle, and we'll be ready to go. Pick the waggler up, loose feeding a few six mils over the top and uh, just fishing a hair rigged uh, six on the hook on the waggler. We're trying to get a little bit of an area going yeah. so we can pick them off. If you catch them over like a, a small area, as soon as you hook one, like they all swim off and it takes them a while to come back. And yeah. like loose feeding a bit of bait, similar to what we do on the pole here, you know, loose feeding a bigger area, you can um, 
you can pick a few off and they don't spook out the peg so much as they, uh, they would do on a feeder and stuff. This time of year when the fish are active and everything like that, you want them grubbing about and mooching about from one bait to the next. Getting them moving between pellets, they get a bit more confident and they, yeah. they'll pick your pellet up without any problems at all. With this wind in that, it's a little bit skimmy, but you know, using a slightly bigger float than you would do for the depth of water and casting a long way past your gear and then obviously sinking the line, getting it back and you can, it's sat there perfectly at the moment. Yeah. The regularity of the feeding means that the fish stay on the bottom and they don't, they're not going like this all the time. Because yeah. if you were going to like feed like five pellets all the time, five pellets, five pellets, you yeah, just get liners. And, and they'd come up in the yeah. water. Yeah, bream are notoriously difficult to catch shallow unless, you know, they get fish for quite a lot on it. On a venue like this, the skimmers are of such a mixed size. Trying to figure out where each of those fish are going to be in the, in the height of the water is, you know, near impossible. So more bait, less regularity, keep them on the bottom and at least you know where, exactly where they are then. It's important with these skimmers, isn't it? Just play them nice and soft and keep them coming. Yeah, basically with, with a lot of skimmers on any venue you go to, even though I've got the rod down low, the skimmers still come up on the top. I mean, if you play, the rod, play it with the rod too high, they come up on the top, splash, and that's usually when they come off. See, what I do now is like, keep the rod nicely low. I'm in sort of net, netting range, swap sides like that. Don't wind anymore, keep it nice and flat. And at the last minute, lift him up, and he straight goes. in. In they go, simple as that. That's a lovely fish as well, that, isn't it? Yeah, cracker, absolute Look cracker. Good condition on that. He's woofed that pellet down, you can see in his mouth there, it's about pound and three quarters, I suppose. That fish is actually excreted pellets, is it? Yeah, that's just chewed up pellets. If I was wanted to get my nose very close to that, it'd probably smell a fish meal, but I don't. What a day's fishing you've had? It's turned out all right in the end. It's been like difficult conditions, flat, calm, red art and stuff. But you know, the baits prove that we've uh, we can uh, catch a few fish where uh, others fail. Well, mate, a masterclass. Well done. Cheers, buddy. Thank you very much. With 12 different lakes, this is Cobhouse Fisheries. We've got two great anglers. We've got a first-class venue. This is going to be exciting. Let's have a little look and see what the guys have brought and what they're going to be using today, tactics-wise. Because I found myself in my customary end peg, I've gone out an all-out positive approach. I'm just doing margin fishing, and I want to keep it as positive as I can. You're going to be fishing yeah, literally got, both margins. Yeah, both margins. I'm right jammed in a corner. I'm going to fish a metre from my first bank, which is directly in front of me. I've got two foot in depth. Uh, and then I'm going to my left, where I've got just a little bit less, so I've set up another rig, but the same float, yep. um, which will let me have a bit of variation fishing off bottom. It's a softish Matrix 12 hollow, hollow elastic to 018 line, to a Series 1.2 float, nice strong nylon bristle, balsa body, very strong carbon stem, right. and I'm coming down then to just got three number 9 droppers, 015 bottom with a 16s, carp bagger hook, and a hybrid hook, Wide gate, very sharp point. Good last year, good old session. Considering you're fishing down the edge, which we normally do on a pole, you've got a rod set. <laughs> yeah, and the reason for that is when, when I'm margin fishing, be it with pellets, be it with ground bait, when I hook a fish, as the fish has cleared the swim, I like to feed and build confidence in the, in the peg again, so another fish can come back, and there's something waiting there for me. Once I've netted that fish, I'm back in, there's another one there waiting. I like to feed just a ball that's similar to like the size of the method that I'll be using. Very cunning. That's um, a 30 gram. Uh, matrix evolution feeder. It's that sort of amount of ground bait that'll be on it. So every time I feed I like that, there'll be a plop, 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 plop. And at certain times of day, such as now, big, bright, brandy ball in the sky, beaming down on the peg, the shadows coming across the water, the yep. fish start to spook. That's when I can pick up this little nine footer, drop a little method up the margin. And because they've got used to that plop, plop, they ain't gonna be spooked, they're not gonna be concerned. To them, it's just another free offering. Bang. All right, Tom. Um, I notice you haven't got any top kits with you. You've just got a couple of method rods there. Yep, just an out-and-out -out method feed approach for me today. I find myself up, up against like point of an island between two well, islands. Yeah, your peg's a little bit further down. Yeah, right? I've picked three sort of areas of my peg that I'm going to fish. Fishing them a little bit different. Two spots against the island. One to the point. One just slightly into the normal bank. One's going to be with two mil special G pellets. What have you done with those? You've just soaked those slightly, have you? Yeah, I've put them in a bait tub, pint of pellets, 
pint of water pretty much, just tap them down so they all get some and then just put the lid on and leave them until you're ready to start fishing. Why have you chosen these pellets? I mean, I know they're a super premium pellet, aren't they? They just seem to bring so many fish into your bag. Don't need to use anything else, really. The other swim will be entice ground bait with entice meat on a hook. And that's just purely because I've never been here before. I don't quite know what they want. That's, that's a really good tip, actually, isn't it? You know, yeah. If you've not been to a venue before, take a selection of baits try different ones on different lines and you'll soon find out which one they want on the day. Yeah. The third area I'm fishing will be a short line at about five or six metres. I'm going to be throwing small balls of softened pellets right. and feeding six mils quite heavy for later in the day. But some of the six mil carp pellets that we got, I'll also put them on the band as well on that line. Ah, so you use those on the hook as, yeah. well, as well as to feed loose on, yeah. on the short yeah. line. You're a bit of a master at this sort of game, aren't you? Because you know, you've had some you had some huge weights of fishing those styles. Yeah. So it's, I still suppose it's surprising really that you come here to a place you don't know, first thing you're gonna do, fish your strengths. You've got a turbo halibut marines there, yep. pre-drilled ones, yep. those just give you alternate, alternate hook baits I suppose, do they? Yep, just like to have loads and loads of options for hook bait. I mean, it's good to have as many as you can really, yeah. because so, uh, yeah, it's unusual to catch on one bait all day long. And when right, you do, okay. that's generally when you've got 300 pounds at the end of the day, so. Ah, uh, one of those days. <laughs> yeah. Les, what have you got set up? The mix I've chosen is cold sweet fish meal carp. It's a two kilo bag, and then I've put a full kilo bag of entice meaty mixing with all the molasses and the fish meal in that. It's, it's a fantastic attractive. It really, really gets them carp rubbing around. The high protein, what's in the meaty mix, that really gets them. There's little tiny bits of meat in there, the aminos. Yeah. They're getting digging. I'll probably add a few dead reds so that it all starts layering up and they can really so start maggots, to fire Some maggots, a couple of little particles from the search gives for. Gives variation in bait, because I will be using entice meaty palami. This has become a huge hit between all the bait tech boys now, hasn't it? Uh, the, the amount of fish that I've caught on this in, in my short time with bait tech is, has been unbelievable. And I've stopped using conventional meats, what you buy off the shelf. This is what I use now. Two tins there. I should be hooking that on the pole rig, putting a little bit on the hair. Another reason for why, why I did put the uh, meaty mix in with that fish meal, as you can see, it's originally quite a light mix. Yeah. Um, and that being like a reddish sort of colour, it sort of bought it more back because this is a red clay bottom. It's going to blend in it's with the blend in quite. It ain't going to stand out, you yeah. know. So they're going to be looking. They're going to be smelling all them oils and all the aminos and everything's going to be bubbling up. A few tins of corn as well. That's just alternating hook baits. Just alternating hook baits, mate. That's all it is. You know, it's always nice to have a variation. Sometimes, you know, they've seen it all before. We've all been in that yeah, situation yeah, yeah, and a course. little change of up bait can get you another bite, another fish. Pressure's on now. Any idea how many you've had? 15 or 16 fish so far. Already? Yeah. Wow. What, what are you fishing at the moment? The six mil carp pellets on the on the band. Yep. As you can see, the hair's quite short on that. It's practically touching the bend of the hook, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. With an effort feeder being like this, yep. with the bait being like this, when the fish comes in and picks it up, it can't take the, the pellet without having a hook as well. Just put the pellets in the mould like that. Yeah. Yeah. With these feeders, I've taken the middle rib out of the feeder, so the hook's got nowhere to catch on. And it's just a simple case of pressing it in. Simple as that. Just like that. And these pellets go really nice and sticky once they're soaked up. So they, Perfect for the method. Yeah, they actually get to the bottom. You're obviously clipped up because you land in that feeder in exactly the same spot every single chuck. How do you get it so bang on all the time? Is it just practice? Before I start the session, I'll, I'll always clip up with like a bomb that's as heavy or heavier than the feeder that I'm actually using. Right, oh, that's another one. <laughs> I can cast that short and then actually let a bit of line out by the clip every time I do it. So, yeah. you know. You... So to start off, you drop it short, take a feet, up, a foot or two off, Yeah. cast out again. If you're still not absolutely on the money, take another foot off, try again until you've got it going down the same place every single time. Yeah. Well, you certainly do make it look like second nature, mate. There's no doubt about it. It's important to hit your clip but not to bounce the feeder as well, if you know what I mean. Right, okay. You know, so it's, it's once you've been doing it a little while, you, you learn to just touch it and yeah. then drop the rod straight away. Another lovely fish, mate. They like these carp pellets, don't they? They do. 
when you're casting a long way, obviously your feed is a little bit closer yeah, to the rod top. Yeah, you winding it up a bit, yeah. Bring it back nice and slow. And then as soon as you let go... So as soon as you feel that feeder hit that clip... You drop the rod straight away. Drop, it goes in with it almost like a plop, doesn't Boop. it? Mm. <laughs> this is getting silly now, isn't it? <laughs> you didn't even have time to sink the line then, did you? No. That's how devastating it can be. No wonder you do some silly weights on it. It's, uh... it's a simple method. I don't, fan don't think I'd fancy taking you on at it, that's for sure. But it's obvious that they absolutely love these special G pellets. They're queuing up, aren't they? As soon as that feeder goes in, they're on it, aren't they? Yeah. Even though we've brought two different types of bait for two different styles. Yeah. You started on pellets. And they're and, loving it. And they, they love it. <laughs> yeah. When you're catching this quick, there's no need to change, is it, at the moment? No. On harder days, ground bait is, is better, you know? There's, yeah. there's times when ground bait is important for you. Your method fishing. If I'm casting a long way or it's deep water, yeah. binding the pellets up with a bit of ground bait as well is definitely a fishing it what we call 50 50. 50 yeah. 50, yeah. Or even, you know, just throwing a handful in there, just mm. especially when you're using the coarse pellets because, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> Another one got in the way then. Whoa! <laughs> Considering you've never been here before, yeah. I think I won't come back if you're coming. <laughs> I'm not striking a line to sink it or anything like that. Right, it's okay. Just, it's just literally hold the rod under the surface and when I put my rod on the rest, I'm not making any any conscious move to tighten up to it. If you move the feeder, the cast is a waste of time. You just want to bring it in and cast it out again. So yeah, it makes you when, once it's landed, leave it there. Leave it there. And it's, it stops you striking at silly little digs and things yep. like that. And, when they t take off a bit, it's just kind of rescuing the rod, really, isn't it? Well, that's it. I mean, there you like go. that. <laughs> We've been uh, plundering away in these margins now for a couple of hours. I'll just give a little bit of a break just to run you through the method that Baytech anglers have been scoring with all over the country. Two cups instantly, a loose ground bait from the start. So I'm in, in my mix, which was the uh, cold sweet fish meal, the uh, enticed meaty mix. There's probably a pint of dead reds and white maggots in that. I'd just be cupping two of those into 18 inches, two foot of water. That would kick my peg off. I'd be looking probably to get through, if the session went well, at least four kilos of this mix in a five hour session. You cannot put enough of this in. You're looking to create a carpet such as the likes of that on the bottom of your peg. The fish can get in there, their tails pop up. You get your big vortex patterns and they're rooting about, they're picking out the dead maggots. This is when you need to sort out what's best for the hook. And this is how I feel that this works best. The end tie sh shows up really well on top. Bright visual baits such as corn, worms, everything works well on top of that little area that you're trying to build. Lots of people tend to just put one ball in at the start, little bits of maggots, little bits of pellets, bit of worm, wrong. We want a nice big flat plateau of bait get the fish rooting around, really grubbing, stirring that bottom up, competing for food, and then we're targeting our hook bait. Now, once you've started catching, the idea is to keep the fish in the peg. I'd feed a little tiny ball, just snapped off. So if I felt like they could take a throw, I would feed it as soon as I hooked that fish. Otherwise, I'd be topping up every fish with a tiny little ball, just set on the top of the kinder pot. I do like to vary my hook baits while I'm fishing over that top of that maggot and ground bait area. Either two grains of corn, two cubes of enticed polony, two dendrobina. As I mentioned before, throwing method sized balls down into my margin just to build confidence up that if I did need to fish the method feeder, if they started spooking when the pole went over the tops of the red. I use a micro quick stop. A lot of quick stops I've used over the years I've had to cut down in size and they stick over the side of the bait. The Matrix have come up with these tiny little super stops, a lot more squat than others, and they don't protrude any of the bait whatsoever. I use this in conjunction with a squeeze and feed method mould. Uh, basically, just lower your bait into the mould. You load it up, turn over the feeder. Good firm press, and it's easy to just squeeze. And feeders loaded to me that's the perfect amount of feed that i want on that feeder the visual bait of the corn is on top of the ball so as soon as it goes in it starts to break down they're attacking that ball they're right on my hook bait straight away just a simple underarm lob bring the rod round 
dip the rod to sink the line. Some people like to fish it with a slack line. I like to fish it with some tension in the tip so that the fish hooks itself, turns those little tiny knocks into a pull round with a really slack clutch. So that when I do hook the fish, the clutch will do the work and let the fish clear the swim. That's when I'll reach over, grab another ball, and there's one straight away. That could not have gone any better. That fish has cleared itself. You can hear the clutch doing the work. Just put a bit of tension back onto it. Just make sure it clears the area because they'll still spook the fish that are down that margin. It's still relatively close. Not as big as some of the fish we've been having, to be fair. There's been some real munters down that edge today. A little common. That's how devastating it can be. Let's have a check on the short line now. I know you're catching one, one bung on that long line, but I'm dying to see if there's any fish there. Two mil carp pellets around the feeder, as I've been feeding little balls of that, and the six mils. The eight mil will just stick out among the rest. And we'll just fill the feeder. Slackening the clutch off, because the, the bites on this line are absolutely savage, and if you're not ready for them, they will take the rod in. Another good fish, mate, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Slightly bigger stamp on that short line. Well, what an awesome day's fishing we've had at Cobhouse Fishery. We've caught lots of fish on this deadly method of loose ground bait down the edges. We've already put one net back because there were so many of them. And this net pretty much seems to be the same. I'm not going to pull them out because, like I say, we don't want to hurt the fish. Here we go. What a devastating method. What an unbelievable day's fishing that Brilliant, was. Brilliant, mate. Brilliant. That was a masterclass in method fishing, wasn't it? I'm knackered. I bet you are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. I bet your arms are aching like that, aren't they? Yeah, just a bit. Sleep well tonight, mate, yeah. I think. I'm speechless to what I've seen today. That has just been absolutely phenomenal. Well, I hope you enjoyed it, mate. Yeah, I loved it, mate. Superb. Cheers. Well Cheers done. Having me. So preparing two mil, or micro pellets as we call them, for putting round a method feeder, or feeding loose. We need to soften them up slightly. A bag of micro pellets, either the carp feed pellets in a two mil, these premium pellets, or the Bait Tech Special G green pellets. Get yourself a one pint bait box. Don't do it in big batches, there's no point because the, the pellets will condense down on themselves and crush. Pour the dry pellets into your pint pot. So we've got nearly a pint of pellets, ever so slightly lower than the top of the, the bait box. Gently tip the water in. There. Now you can see the water has filled all the little gaps in between all the pellets and that gives you the perfect amount to soak your microbes. Put them to one side, done. Forget about them. Half an hour later, they will be absolutely brilliant for fishing. The River Wye in Herefordshire is known to be the best river fishing in the country. We've got two of the best river anglers to show you exactly how they go about plundering the big shoals of barbel and chub that reside here. This is a man's river that's going to demand really strong, powerful gear with a really attacking approach. Our boys are going to show us exactly how they go about doing it as they've won more money on flowing water than just about anyone in the country. Mr. Arrell. Good morning, Hello, sir. Mate. How are you? Oh, yeah, you good? Yeah, I'm great, thanks. Uh, you weren't joking, were you? You really are going to fish a float with pellets? I told you, didn't I? I mean, can you see any maggots in there? No, no, you're right. There's not there. one in sight, is this? All we've got is pellets and pellets. Pellets and pellets. And more pellets. <laughs> Brilliant. Let's go on with it, shall we? I've got a challenge now. Yeah, I? you're on. <laughs> Traditional float fishing on rivers is normally maggots, casters, hemp as loose feed. You've come today with a couple of bags of the, the Bait Tech carp pellets. How on earth, what on earth is going on? 
when I was out fishing on the Wye, I was, I was getting absolutely mullered with little tiny fish. And it was apparent to me that I needed to get a different particle bait because they're still chubbing the swim, it's just the case that they couldn't get at it. It was either the case of looking at a bigger hook bait, um, but then I thought, well, why not completely change things and start fishing with bigger baits altogether? Yeah. Pellets for barbel and things like that are nothing new really. All the specialist guys have been using them for a long time. Initially, I was going down the route to try the same pellets that we used in the feeder. Right, okay. Halibut pellets, right. The actual bait was too heavy. Mm -hmm. for float fishing because what was happening is that halibut's a very dense bait as you know and I mean I, I always use it for barbel fishing now yeah. but as I was trying to float fish with it as it hit the water it was just sinking straight to the bottom and obviously yeah. my float's going off further on so mm -hmm. I needed a lighter bait so what I did is just eventually settled on on a combination of six mil and eight mil carp pellets in exactly the same way as you would do on uh, on commercial the difference is you see when you when you throw this bait into the current the bait carries a long way down the stream. Because they're less dense than the halibut pellets, they, they fall, yeah. fall a lot slower, don't and they? That, and that's really important. With maggots, it's not unusual to fish 30 or 40 yards of a river. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. It was a case, really, of thinking about where you put your bait. A lot of people, I think, make the mistake of just feeding in one area. Mm. And once that bait's ended up in the bottom, that's it. You know, So I'd always use a catapult and actually feed down the swim as well. Initially, I was a bit worried that I might overfeed the swim too soon. Everywhere I go on these sort of swims, now I'm taking a bag of sixes and a bag of eights. The answer to how much do I feed is really down to sort of fish response. You need to work it out on the day. This is almost a revolution in river fishing. Yeah, though, it is. It's a massive revolution. And what's coming from it is that I've been doing some features recently, you know, things like Angling Times, and people from all over the country are sending me emails about, you know, I've, I've tried this on my little river, but I'm normally pestered with minnows and this, yeah. that, and the other. And they're catching chub with it. I mean, on small waters, you don't need a lot of bait to catch a good yeah. bag of fish, really. Talk to me about floats then, Dave. We've got some here that you've obviously designed yourself. and. We're going to be using the, using the waggler ranges today, don't we? Because I know we're fishing a little bit further out. Um, obviously, if you're fishing a little bit closer in, you've got that model. Yeah, I always try to keep my, my float fishing as simple as possible. Right. I mean, I carry a lot of different patterns of floats for different situations. For fishing close in water, uh, if I've got any depth at all, I would use this Avon shape. You know, you've got a nice shoulder there to hold back against. I mean, six gram was the biggest one I used to make, but as a direct result of this bait, I've actually used, I've yeah, actually got some 8 gram and 10 gram, which just to really be able to fish the bait in very deep water and, and, and to see see the float a long way down. All of these floats have got very visible tops. When I mean, you're yeah. fishing a big bait, now you can always put more shot on and dot it down, but if you can't see it, mm. you need to leave some float out. And I think that's one of the problems with a lot of floats these days, that the tips aren't big enough. And these were like the, the forerunner of the pallet waggler, if you like. I mean, these are called speci wagglers. So I've set up a rig to fish the first part of the swim deep. Mm -hmm. And I've got another rig to fish the second part of the swim shallow. What about main lines? Because obviously we're fishing for big, big chub, fish. Yeah, you know. it's 0.22 mil, which is six pound breaking strain. You need something that's robust. Right. Locked off with swan shots down the line. All I've literally got on that rig is just two number fours. On the hook itself, to actually mount the bait, you'll notice that I've got this little band. I just use a section of um, eight millimeter float rubber. Right, and you've just literally put the hook through it. So I just crimp it together, and I've just hooked it through like you would almost like it with a maggot. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, yeah. You can see how, how firm that is. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So the thing is then, when I want to come and put a pellet on, I just slip that into oh. the band. Made for it. And away you go. Yeah, that's ideal, isn't it? And you could argue, well, it's a different colour to the pellet, but when a bait's flying through the speed of the current here, I don't think fish they, have got time no, to they, say, they snatch it, there's they? an 8mm float rubber on there, yeah. and I'm going to take it. You know? And the lovely thing about these pellets is that they, they expand quite quickly. The minute they hit the water, it's tight in the rubber. I could get several casts out of that before it's time to put another one on. I've got a powerful rod, 14-foot rod, simple open face reel, loaded right to the top, you know, so it's easy for casting. What about your other setup? It's an identical... It's exactly the same. I always recommend that people match tackle. I think it's absolutely vital that when you pick up different float rods, that they're all, they all match. You showed us that you've got a bulk around the main float. Yeah, it's exactly the same on the, on the deeper rig. And I lock off not just with one or two sh shots. I mean, you can actually get these big, yeah. these big shots now, but by putting several, just, it, it just helps to stop it slip. Yeah. Stop you it don't, slipping have, to, you don't have to put one on super hard, do you? Yeah. You can put on. Whereas on that rig, I've got it set about four foot deep with two number fours down. Yeah. I've got this one set at about eight foot with four number fours. There's the hook, there's the shot. What have I got? 18 inches to two foot, I suppose. Yeah. The bait, by its very nature, I mean, it, it's heavier than maggots, so the bait is going to take take everything to the bottom. Mm. But what I wanted to do is create a continue, continuous stream of feed going down the river. Yeah. And all the time the float goes down the swim, the float will be covering the feed. 
This is something I've never seen done before. Float fishing with pellets on rivers. Let's hope it works now. Yeah. <laughs> before we start fishing, I always try and get a bit of bait into the swim to get the fish confident. I can't see any point in just casting him just with a, with a bait and have no feed out there. No, so, no, no. You know, and also it can spook the fish. If, if you're in a swim where there's only a few fish there, you want to get them feeding regularly. So the other nice thing about this bait, Andy, is that you can get more distance. I mean, you can see there's like a facing wind coming into yeah. us today. Mm. Now, if this was maggots and casters, you'd never get them out. Would you? Well, you know, I mean, look at that. I'm getting, I'm getting two thirds across a very wide bit of river. The six mils have probably got about ten pellets. Yeah. Yeah. The eight mils, four or five, maybe three. Mm -hmm. you know, but the beauty of it is, I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm actually firing bait all around the swim. You can imagine that just drifting down yeah, and yeah, chubbing yeah, the area, yeah. and lovely pale colours, so they're very visible. But I'll probably spend, you know, five or ten minutes just putting a bit of bait in, you know, in a normal session, just to get fish confident. I don't want everything tight. Right? What I want is a shoal of fish. I mean, hopefully, if there's a lot of fish in front of us, I'd like the fish, you know, all over the place. I've got the deep rig on. When we cast in that pellet, it's important to have enough weight around the float, in this instance, yeah. with a waggler rig. It's important when we cast out, the two don't come together. Yeah. You know, we need to sort of get the cast, and then what we'll always Fe Feather do it down so it... Always it, check it, it yeah. Lays, it lays out. Right, you just notice, just towards the end of the cast, so just check the line. You want to be able to see that pellet landing. You know, actually splashing on the water, and you know it's not tangled there. Yeah. Because we've got quite a, yeah, it's quite a heavy weight we're casting at the extreme end of the rig. Hello, there's a fish. Oh. You've not had a fish. Hang on a minute, Dave. What's. Told you, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> That's never a chub. It feels like it, Andy. There's some big fish here, you know. I mean... Well, they, they do say, don't they, on the River Wye, that they're born at four pounds. <laughs> there's a lot of big fish. I mean, my, my biggest chub at this river is six pound four, but one of my. Uh, That's huge. One of my customers last year had one six fourteen. Okay. See what I mean about going for snags as well? That is absolutely glorious. What a way to catch them. You see, you've got to have strong gear on. You probably oh. noticed with that fish like running down the inside, he was looking for snags all the time. <laughs> There's the chub you wanted, mate. Good God, look at that. It's perfect, isn't it? Look at, look at the pellet band stuck in his mouth. That is absolutely stunning. It's almost like he's never been caught before, isn't it, that one? Oh, it, looks, it just looks brand new, doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely stunning. Shall we catch some more? Yeah. Yeah, you can. That's un unreal, isn't it? What I want you to do is quickly show me your, your ground bait mix, because it really is quite simple, isn't it? Yeah, a pure mix of halibut marine method mix. Uh, nothing else? Nope, don't mix anything else with it. This is designed as a method mix, um, so it mixes very well. Ideal for big rivers when you want a mix that's going to stay on the bottom, but also give off attractants as well. And then we'll add some particles in. We'll add some four mil pellets right, okay. and some super seed hemp so that there's a better feed going on the bottom, but we're also getting the attractant, the explosion from the ground bait as it, as it hits the bottom and fizzes out. So these are two kilo bags, so they're really handy. I don't have to take, bring multiple bags, usually one bag's more than ample. We tip it into the bucket. You can smell it instantly, yeah. can't you? It's also got a, almost like a dampness to it, which is the oils. You see it sticking to my hand already. Yeah. So it's really giving off lots of flavor. But the main thing is the particles and the crushed bits and pieces in there, they're not too big. I'm in control of what's going in there by putting pellets and seeds. Uh, into that. We've got away now, haven't we, from the old style coarse ground baits that we used to use years ago. Because of the fine particles, it's going to break down really quickly, even in a stiff consistency. We understand a lot more about ground baits these days. Ten years ago, we wouldn't use ground bait for barbel, mm. but we understand what it can deliver into the river and, and what an advantage it can be to the conventional just feeding particles. All I need is a one pint container of water. No need for adding bits and pieces like we do with other ground baits, just simply pour a pint in. I'm going to do this with a whisk, which is easy, but you could do it by hand, it doesn't make a difference. Just giving it a whisk around. 
well. You can see there's no need to riddle that, is there? No, straight away, it's a fine mix. It's already got its, you know, it's forming. It's, yeah. it's, it's sticky already, uh, but you can feel it's still got a certain dryness to yeah. it. Leave that for five minutes. That's all it'll take. Right. And then it's a simple case after five minutes, you take another pint of water. In goes the second pint. Okay. You'll see now. Oh yeah, it's a completely different texture now, isn't it? Yeah, you can see now I can do anything with that. I can put that into a cage feeder, I can mix it into a ball. But the main thing is now, is I'm going to add particles to it. I'm going to put four mil pellets in there, which are quite a big particle, and the hemp seed is big as well. And it needs to be able to take that without breaking it down. If I did want to throw a ball in, I don't want it to break, break down. I want right. it to hit the water, hit the bottom, and then break down. So basically what you've got there is absolute ultimate attraction. Yeah, everything that you want for a barbel mix. Right. I want the pellets uh, and the particles to sort of sit on the bottom. So we're creating a carpet so, of seed. So you're almost ringing a dinner bell for them to come and eat at the table, aren't you? Exactly. A third of a bag of pellets. There's no need to be shy. At the end of the day, barbel will eat a huge amount of food. They'll feed when they're ready and they'll stop when they're ready. I put less hemp than I put pellets in. The super seed is a, is a good large grain hemp seed. I'll just take handfuls, just drain it off. You can see how much juice is on this hemp. Yeah. If you were to drain that off earlier, a good addition to ground bait is hemp, hemp liquor, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you can add that to anything. So I'm just going to mix that in by hand now. We end up with a ground bait that's chock full of little particles, little attractants, bits fizzing off here and there. But the main thing is, is we're getting some bait to the bottom that'll break down and create our bed of feed. You're gonna have a bed of bait with one of those sat there on top with your hook in. Exactly that. I mean, barbel by their very nature, their browsers, you know, they'll sort of, you know, feast over and start picking up these particles. That's all on the bottom. Um, so generally, you know, they'll come around, much around, and then they'll come over top and boom, we're, we're ready in. to go. Yeah. First thing I've noticed before we start fishing, uh, is your setup. It looks a little bit stronger than the type of thing I'd use on your average commercial. There's a lot that comes into play on the river, not only the heavy flow, but we've got rock slate beds, we've got rocks dotted around the river. There's so much that can cause your tackle to, to malfunction. So it's got to be robust and you've got to be using everything that you're confident in because a lost fish, especially with barbel, uh, means lost money really. Yeah. You can't afford to lose these fish. They do pull a little bit as well, don't they? Yeah, a nine pound barbel thrashing its head can do a lot of damage. I like to use a long feeder rod. This one's 13 and a half foot. I want as much line out of the water as possible. Right, I'm going okay. to be casting here today uh, two thirds across the river. Any debris coming down is going to catch the line. If the line's in the water, there's going to be a lot more drag, which is you know, potentially exactly. going to bump your feeder out, out of place. Exactly. If I use a really heavy line, then that's going to create drag as well. Yeah. So this has got to be balanced. So it's a case of making sure your lines are strong enough to do the job but you don't want to be too strong that they're going to affect how much lead you need to use to hold the feeder steady. It can very quickly become unbalanced and you don't get the best from your rig. This is based around the old fashioned loop rig where the feeder would be running in a short loop, um, creating a sort of a running feeder, but then a bolt effect. What we've done is change the rig so that the rig is running on a double piece of line, but it's also with the, with the incorporation of the rig stops. Okay, those slide up away and if it should become entangled, that will pull away and the fish isn't going to be dragging that feeder around. So you've, you've never got a tethered fish. Exactly. Right. When a barbel's shaking its head and that's rattling around, it's creating so much wear and tear on your line here. Yeah. And obviously the obvious answer is, well, you use a thicker line. But as I said, if you use a thicker line, you're not going to, the rig's not going to react so well. If that's eight pound monofilament. When it's doubled up in a loop, you've basically got the equivalent to 16 pound line there. Right. In that part of the rig, which is the zone, which I would expect to take the most, most hammer. By doubling this section of line up as well and putting knots in it, you're basically stiffening it, aren't you? Yeah. And that creates a sort of boom. Yeah. What it does is, it, it, as well as adding strength to the rig, it does create that stiff rig. So when the feeder is on the bottom, it keeps the hook bait away from the feeder, creating less tangles, but it can also ride up, the, the flow can catch in these knots, yeah. uh, and it creates a, sometimes a wafting hook bait, right, uh, okay. so up and down, so it's it's catching the flow as well. It's all adding to the effectiveness of the rig. The other key thing as well is I use these gripper stops, but I put two on the line together, with one facing what some people would term as the wrong way. Yeah. But the key with that is if you look on the, when the swivel, it's that, yeah. it kicks it out. That's interesting. Yeah. So you've almost got a 90 degree angle, which is keeping all your hook length and the line below the feeder away from the feeder. So when I cast out, I'm gonna get a lot less tangles. Moving down, I see you've got 
two and a half foot hook length? It's a diameter 021, uh, so it's got a breaking strain of about eight, about eight pounds. It is a low diameter line, pre-stretched. Some people don't like using them. I, I, I find them fine as long as you keep an eye on them during the session. I've got boxes full, tied up ready, so if I need to change, I can. it's, it's literally 30 seconds. I like the uh, the lie of that and the, the fish can't see it. I would have thought you'd have a hair rig on there, but you've got what looks to be a standard spade, very strong admittedly. How are you going to mount your pellets? I will start with a bunch of maggots. That might fly in the face of everything we've said about halibut products being so the vogue bait for barbel. This is simply a matchman's approach to barbel fishing. There's an early opportunity to catch barbel in conjunction with grain bait because when that feeder is full of grain bait, you cast that out. Obviously there's a lot of particles and bits and pieces that fly off that. There'll be a rush of fish that will come to that straight away. Right, okay. But when that hits the bottom, there's lots of bits coming off and they're not they're not trickling along the bottom, they're actually going through they're the bottom. They're going down on the flow, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. So yeah. the barb will instinctively come in and flash around and it can be quite territorial and they're quite aggressive feeders. Now if I put a pellet on, that's quite a heavy hook bait and that'll go straight on the bottom and lie on the bottom. Yeah. But at that stage, the barb will generally aren't ready to lie down and, and feed on the bottom. They're still flashing around and looking what's what's just landed in front of them. So I can catch with just a simple bunch of maggots, you can usually catch a couple of early fish all the time, there's plenty of particles in the grain bait going down and landing on the bottom, yeah. which they will settle on later. What I'm doing is just giving myself an opportunity to catch a couple of early fish, which as we know in match fishing is essential. And those early fish can be the difference between catching 30 pounds and catching 50 pounds at the end of the match. Giving me a great understanding of how, how the rig actually works with the ground bait in the flow and the fish coming in, that, that initial rush. Mm onto those flavours, they come straight in and you can pick them off on maggots. As the session progresses, I would expect them to get more uh, honed in on the bait that's landed on the bottom, right. um, in which case I might switch to, the, uh, to a block end feeder and just start feeding particles, pellets and hemp. Yeah. They'll be grazing over a bed exactly. then, won't they? So then they'll be picking mm. up baits off the bottom. I want to see it in action. So how long would you generally leave a cast in, Dave, before winding in and, and recasting? The way we always used to do it um, with feeder fishing on the river was you'd sort of cast out and you would leave it no time at all and wind it back in and cast and keep casting to try and build it up. With the size of feeders we're using and the amount of bait we're putting in, I'll literally, when your confidence is high, I'll leave that feeder in until I get a bite. It's such a big food parcel and it's got so many smells and attractants coming off it that really I can leave it there with the confidence that it's going to attract fish to it. Right, oh yeah, that is a fish. And this I think is a barbel. You can tell there. It looks it. <laughs> yeah, you can tell it's starting to move upstream. As soon as you hooked that, it stripped a bit of line off you, didn't it? It was a <laughs> these things growl a bit, don't they? They do. When they swim upstream, it does help a bit. The problem yeah. with the barbel is, is obviously that you don't have to look at the shape of them to realise uh, where they like to be that's on the bottom. There's something special about them. Every time you see them, they've just got such a presence about them. These are the key fish in some ways because these are the fish that you catch early. These are like the foot soldiers. They get in first. They want to see, they're the inquisitive ones. They want to Look see what's going that. on. Yes, we're in. You tend to catch these fish early on and then the bigger ones later on. And a fish of that, I mean, that's, that's a five pound fish. Look at that, perfect. Absolutely stunning. Look at the colors on it. You can see where they get their power from, though. Oh, look at that. Look what it's just... You see that? Look at that. It's actually just pooed halibut ground bait and halibut pellets all over your hand. I think that tells you how, uh, how quick they're digesting this stuff. You know, they can't get enough of it if it's going through them that quickly. You see these pellets have hardly broken down. There's a whole grain of hemp there. It's not every day I like to be pooed on by fish. I think it's fair to say that halibut marine pellets have revolutionised barbel fishing as we know it. It's just the flavour that everything centres around for barbel fishing now. There's lots of little variants on it, but generally it catches all the fish. The barbel obviously know what they're eating. They feel is right for mm. them. It does seem to outscore most other baits. Now the pellets themselves are dark, solid consistency. They're high in oil, so they've got a slower breakdown rate than a coarse, standard coarse pellet. When you're fishing in a river like this, You've got, you've got the flow constantly running over. The slower breakdown is going to 
just be leaking those oils and those tractors over time into the swim, isn't it? Whatever is in the pellets, the, the fish obviously like it, but it obviously draws them into the area as well. There's a lot, lot of stuff coming up that, and they can find it from, from quite a far distance. So it might not, they might not come straight away. The longer those are in the water, the more fish are going to find them. They're made to a recipe that is of such a high standard. We developed the, the Halibut Marine Method Mix to be used in conjunction with Easy Pellets. The two marry up beautifully and that just gives you another way of feeding, another way of sort of impacting on the peg and, and, and you know putting something in the water that's going to make the barbel sort of suddenly wake up and think well what's that? Trigger them to feed really. It's good to have uh, variations you know you've got the different size pellets you've got 12 mils, 8 mils, 10 mils all that can be used on a hair rig or a band. Uh, we've got the mi mix tub here which has got them all in you know they're all different things so you've got something to try all the time because the reality the reality is, in a five hour match, you're not going to get bites all the time. You're not going to catch a barbel every cast. So it's nice to have the variations and things to try. You say, give that 10 minutes, give that 10 minutes. Yeah. And it gives you, keeps your mind active, keeps you trying and keeps different things and hopefully putting more fish in the net. These go right up to a massive 20 mil. Yeah, proper gobstoppers. Yeah. You catch barbel on those? Yeah. I mean, if you only have to look at the, look at a barbel's mouth to realise uh, they can take anything, and they'll take you know a lump of paste wrapped around that as well. So add to that, <laughs> I wouldn't be scared to use that in flood conditions at really? all. Really, that's unbelievable. So basically, halibut marine pellets. No matter what the condition of the river, there's something that's going to catch you barbel here all the time. Yes. Well, mate. Um, I'm a little bit gobsmacked by that, to be honest. I told you it was a good way of catching children barbel, didn't I? Uh, pellets on the float is the future. It's a, it's a method. It's another method, right? It's not just the method, but it's, it's well, on the right peg. It's a fantastic method, isn't oh, it? There's more than a few in there, Dave. Um, we've got, I think we're going to need a crane to get the net out, don't we? we? Oh, yeah, you're right. Look at those, Chubb. Fantastic bag of fish, isn't it? Unbelievable. Easily 80 pound plus there. Oh, yeah. Thought. And all on a bag, a couple of bags of cart pellets. Absolutely. I'm absolutely convinced. It just shows you what can be achieved on not too much bait, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Awesome. Thank Cheers, you Bob. very much. Cheers. Well, what a journey we've been on. We've been to some fantastic venues with some truly brilliant anglers and witnessed some quite incredible sport. To keep a close eye on us and all our anglers and find out what they're getting up to, make sure you visit our website, follow us on Facebook, and of course, come and see us on Twitter. I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have. Until next time, as always, I'll leave you with some of the best bits. Ooh, uh, bit of a fumble there. Should we start that one again? Right, we're about to start fishing, but one prop. Ready? My good friend Lee Werrett's been fishing down here for a few years with some astounding results. He, he fishes the. Oh, sh Steve's going to fish a traditional ground bait feeder, an open end feeder with ground bait. A ground bait feeder with ground bait. <laughs> We've come down to, to feed a fish for these fish. To, uh, fish, fish, fish for fish. We've come to the gorgeous. <laughs> where, where are we again? <laughs> with 12 different lakes, this is Cobbout's farm, I nearly said. A first class. For, and my favourite for this style of fishing, two then two. Blah, blah. <laughs> what a fantastic journey we've been on. We've been. It's super important to all our anglers that we use the best tackle available to us. Join Ian Digcott and UK Garbolino boss Darren Cox to find out a little bit more. Morning Darren, how, how are you doing? You alright? Right. Right, let's have a look at the new rods for 2013 then. I'm really excited. Got a great range of rods, already hit the shops. Garbolino have built a fantastic reputation with rods over the years. It's all down to the design and construction. We've been making poles for a long time and the skills with making poles and rods, they're quite transferable. If you're good at making poles, then you understand how to make rods. That's where I think we've probably scored. We've been making rods and poles in our factory for over 40 years in France, so there's a lot of 
skill there and a lot, a lot of, of knowledge. experience. I know for a fact that we've got a really cult following with our rocket range. A lot of people use these rods. A lot of anglers that you wouldn't imagine use a rod of this price. They've got them in the rod bags. You and I yeah. know anglers. Yeah, exactly. I'm fish one of with them. Us, fish against them. They, they beat us as well. And they, they use these rods. New to the range, we've, we've got a couple of additions. The 11 foot rocket mm -hmm. carp feeder and the 12 foot rocket carp feeder. Now we have got the 11 and 12 foot rods in the range already. Mm. So the difference between these is we've actually designed them as two piece rods. Ah, uh, right, to go in your ready-made rod exactly. bag in that, yeah. The first lot of rods we did they were, were three-piece, very, very good. Mm. But anglers are telling us, you know, you need a two-piece rod, you fall it away. Yeah. Much easier to get out of the bag, much easier to get in the bag. And you know, as a fisherman, you're sat there fishing your pole thinking, mm. should have set the wag up, should have set the feeder up. If it's easy to do, you get up off your box and you do it. Obviously, with the previous range of rocket feeder rods, I'm, I'm assuming these ones are still value for money as no. well. I don't know how they make them for the price. The 11 foot's 39.99, the 12 foot's 44.99. I mean, Considering you get three tips with that as well, absolutely beautiful rods. The, the performance of a rod of that price is just astounding, really. Yeah, it's easy to say it's a great rod, but the key is in the action. Mm. They're all good fish playing actions. You know, you, you can have a good fish playing action. The rod can be too soft to cast, especially mm. with the feeder rod. Yeah. So you've got to have some compression in the lower sections to, to be able to cast accuracy. Mm -hmm. But you get too much compression, when you hook a fish... It pulls the hooks out. Exactly, yeah. you know. Mm. We've got a fantastic new eight foot picker. Like a little bomb rod type thing? Yeah, just, oh, just right, a little yeah. tiny picker rod, eight, eight foot, perfect for you know fishing commercials where you've got bankside foliage, it's tight, you might have a tree either side of you. Yeah, I suppose oh. it's perfect for like F1s and stuff like that, you know, exactly. soft rod in the winter, etc, etc. Yeah. A good silvers rod as well, I suppose. Yeah. Short, mm. short chuck rods, perfect. Mm. In a lot of these places we go these days, you know, you might be casting to an island and it might mm. only be 20 metres, it might be 25, 30, 40 metres. Mm. These rods will do anything. We do rods at um, 12 foot and 13 foot power versions. Um, in the rocket range. I suppose you can use those on rivers and like bigger, longer method chucks yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. The key thing to remember is if you need to go the distance, mm. then you need a longer rod. Mm. A longer rod will get you the trajectory that you need to mm. get you out there. An eight foot picker won't cast you 60, 70 meters. A powered up 12 foot version will do that quite easily. So there's one rod in the range we haven't spoke about yet. A 12 foot carp uh, rocket waggler. Fantastic rod, really is. Again, we've listened to anglers, we know what they want, and what we've done is we've actually changed that into a two-piece version, just all nice and easy, 46.99, perfect rod. I mean, you can get two rods for less than 100 quid and exactly. you're away. The nice thing about this range is you can get two, three, four rods, whatever you want. They do what they say on the yeah. tin. The actions are great, a lovely, crisp casting rods. You can get fishing with them without bumping them off, and they're nice and light to use. And? Fabulous Valley for money. Something I know Diddy is all giddy about, our new G-System range of rods. Oh yes. You love these, don't you? I do love these, <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean, especially that one just there. <laughs> 17 rods in the range. It's a big range, but they are fish specific and technique specific, which mm -hmm. is really important these days. Anglers want a rod for a specific reason. These rods have been built on proven mandrels. We, we've used this exact profile of mandrel for quite a number of years and we cut them differently to change them slightly, make the actions different. But we know these actions work. We know that they're reliable. We know that they, they're good for casting, they're good for striking, they're good for playing fish. Is this the 10 foot you've it's got It's the there? 10 foot mini carp, yes. My Beautiful favorite rod. little tool of choice at the moment. Lovely soft tip with a really nice progressive power action. You've yeah, got, I mean, you can feel it bending right the way through the rod, you know, which reduces hook pulls and everything like that. Yeah. One of the misconceptions is people think that a short rod has to be a really soft rod. Because we're, we're using rods that are much shorter these days, what you need to do is cut the rod down, but keep the correct action. If you've got too much of a parabolic action, then you can't control the fish under the rod tip. With a progressive power action, you can still play the fish sensibly and carefully and safely, but you get it in quickly. Yeah. And that's really important these days in, you know, mm. when you're fishing for 150, 200 pounds of fish, isn't it? When you get your fish close in, it tops up right in front of you Pops instead of up. like, you know, yeah. too yeah. far right. People have this misconception that if it says carp on it, it's no good for bream. No. A good bream rod is generally a good carp rod and vice mm -hmm. versa. Tips interchange with our Super G and the G series feeder rods, which is important if you want to upgrade your rod. A lot of these come with a lovely soft glass tip, so if you want to use it for, for silvers, for, for, for bream fishing, anything like that, then you've, you've got that 
even softer tip. And the good thing about these, all these new rods as well, they're two pieces. Exactly. We've listened to the anglers. We like three piece rods, they create good actions and, mm -hmm. and as rods have evolved, we've realised we can make good two piece rods. The, the build quality is fantastic, got proper Fuji eyes and Fuji reel seats and yeah. the varnishing on it and all the finish is you know, really all nice. All lovely and epoxy. They're not cheap, but of course he never is, you yes, know. Definitely. 150 to 179 pounds, the rods will last, you know. Yeah. They'll last forever. Also in the range, Ian, as you know, we've got the pickers. Nine foot and 10 foot traditional picker rods. Lovely little delicate rods. Perfect for like straight lead work on the rivers. Yeah. Little tiny ground bait feeders, bread feeders. If you're fishing for skimmers and stuff and catch a road carp, these are still perfectly handle anything It's all like about that. balanced tackle, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You know, if you're using this type of rod, it's a light rod, mm. it's a delicate rod, you've got to use light gear. We've also got 12 foot and 13 foot power feeders in the range. Okay. This one, for example, the um, specimen power feeder. That'll cover all your distance, carp fishing, your big fish, river fishing. If you want to catch chub or barb on the river, mm. feeder fishing, that's perfect. If you want to fish for um, carp at distance with a great big feeder. Mm. Again, it's back to, you know, you need some power in the rod, you need some length in the rod. Mm -hmm. If you're fishing on a river, you're fishing with the rod up high, your rod needs to cope with the, the flow and so it you kind of, have some power in it. Yeah, kind of perfect for this um, ground bait feeder and pellets method that we do exactly. on these rivers nowadays. Yeah. I, yeah. I use, use that one for barbling. You know, I've noticed this one's got a lot bigger eyes than um, previous models and that. Our best selling distance feeder, mm. we've revamped that again. This is this has come into this range. It's the same blank of rod, the tip of the rod. Um, all the guys are a lot bigger. So it's mu much better for, for casting with shock leads and things like that. Yeah, I mean, the distance feeder rod is, is, is an immense piece of kit. Like, you know, you can chuck it as far as you possibly want. Yeah. But I mean, I understand that, you know, you want to go a little bit further using a shot leader and obviously with shot leader comes knots and stuff yeah. like that. You know, bigger eyes would obviously help eliminate those problems. Yeah. It's about listening to anglers. Mm. You know, we'd, we've sold a lot of distance rods to a lot of good bream anglers mm. all over the country. They've said to us, give us bigger guys on the tip. So we've responded to that and you know, it's hopefully it's created an even better rod. So the last rod in the range we haven't spoken about Ian is the G-System 12 foot waggler. We've not had a two piece rod in this price range before. Two piece rods are the best selling rods. It's what mm -hmm. commercial carp anglers want. The mm -hmm. beauty about it is good fish play in action, but most importantly, you can cast with it. Yeah. It's okay having a nice soft action, but if it's like a noodle, you're not going to be able to cast it. This rod will cast from 3 AA right up to 15 gram. The length of the rod gives you a nice like, line pickup as well. For years and years we've been using longer rods. It's traditionally the way we should fish. We've learned now that shorter rods are the right way. Superb rod, 139.99. Yeah. That's yeah. brilliant for the money. Yeah. Looks beautiful as well. This is our new bazooka our hollow elastic. This is a twin core. We've changed the inner part of the elastic rather than um, having a, a larger outer core and a thin inner core attached to that outer wall, we've increased the diameter of the inner core, which has some real good advantages in fishing. As your elastic pulls out of the tip of the pole and it, it sort of falls over, it, it doesn't flatten out. Mm. It doesn't bottom out and it doesn't overlie anywhere near as much as it normally would because the inner core is holding it in that, that cylindrical shape, which is really important when you're trying to create an even pressure on fish. You know when you, you're playing fish how that important that is, especially when you've got big fish with small hooks. You're giving yourself a much more even breaking system and that's the best way you can play fish. You apply even pressure to fish, it, it confuses them. They only come one way and that's towards you. The new packaging is very important as well. It's what we call elastic friendly. We put a lot of silicon lube inside the back which keeps the elastic in perfect condition for when you're ready to use it. Latex naturally rots in mm. the sea. Yeah. So you, we all know you've got to change your elastics a lot. In this packaging it will be perfectly all right. It'll keep the elastic fresher for longer. You've also got there, Ian, connector and a protector. Yeah. You get those free charge with your elastic. It's brilliant, isn't it? Can't say any further than that, can you? No, it's great. Same price as your elastic. Mm. You know, you get three meters of it, plus those. These make it much easier to elasticate your poles. A lot of people don't use them, but when you're using top two elasticated kit, as you pull it apart and separate it, if you drop that round the end of the, the elastic, it'll keep your elastic in much better condition. Well, it, you know, it won't flatten off your elastic against yeah. the uh, the side of the ball so of the pole. Easy for the, the hole to be 
popped into the elastic. There's nothing worse than getting your elastic out and it's all crinkled against the edge of the pole. It can only be a good thing. 10.99 to 12.99 depending on the, uh, the size of the elastic you buy. But great stuff. We've got the new elastic in the pole. What's next? Rigs. Oh, I'm really excited about it, as you can tell, can't yeah, you? It's taken a long time to get these right. They're great. Mm -hmm. And they've got something really special and different. There's lots and lots of pole rigs on the marketplace. For simple reason, there's lots of anglers buy pole rigs. Mm. They don't want to spend hours and hours setting the pole rigs up. Each one of the pole rigs on the market has one fundamental flaw. What happens when you lose a hook? Well, they've got to buy a load of loose hooks or spare exactly. hooks to nylon, or worst case scenario, you know, you've got to buy another rig. Well, this is where these rigs come mm. in. So if you, you just attach this rig in, okay. we'll unravel it and um, I'll show you what I mean. Looks familiar line. <laughs> yeah, garble line, good line. You unravel that. DCX pole floats. Three rubbers on every float, so you know, the, the set up perfectly. So you've got a top quality float, got top quality garble line. Shot in pattern there as well, you know. Yeah. Shot, small shots instead of two bigger shots like small you've seen on shots. other rigs. Num number eight's largely, and, and where we need them, smaller ones. Mm -hmm. These are actually put on the, the line well. Mm. So if you need to, you can move them about. The rigs are set up so you don't need to move them about. There's no hook. Correct. <laughs> That's where these come in. It's really, really clever. Rather than attach a hook to that, mm -hmm. we've put two choices of hooks on, onto the winder. Two? On this DCX float, you've got a choice of two hooks. So for example, size 12, mm -hmm. power carp, and a size 14. So you could choose the hook you want according to, to the match bait, your bait and... and the fish you're looking to catch. Mm. And a simple loop to loop method to attach it, which anybody can tie that kind of knot. You stick that on and you're fishing. The good thing about it is, is obviously if I lose this hook or I need to step up my um, hook bait yeah, size or yeah. anything, you've got a spare one there. You've got a choice of hook size. Mm. Um, most of the diameters are the same size but you get a choice of, say, a 14 hook or a 16 hook or an 18 hook or a 16 hook. If you're fishing sweet corn or meat, you want a bigger hook on. Mm. If you decide, well, I'm going to have a try and fish, say, maggot or a small pellet, soft pellet, mm. take that hook off, start again. It just means that your rigs last much, much longer. A bit more versatile as well. Yeah. They sell at £3.50, standard price on the marketplace, mm -hmm. but you're getting all quality kit, the line, the shot, the, the floats, and you're getting two hooks it gets even better. We've created a new winder. You're getting 10 hooks nylon on one rig for 199. Mm -hmm. And the beauty about this, they're exactly the same length as your pole winders. So you put them straight into your rig tray next to your, the, the winders that you're going to use. Mm. It just all makes sense. So I suppose it? with like, you know, the amount of rigs that we've got for availability and obviously the hooks to nylon as well, I mean, the combination's endless. All the rigs are done on various lengths. So you've got shallow rigs, you've got slapping rigs, You've got margin rigs, paste rigs, deep rigs, silver rigs. So there's a comprehensive range. One of the fundamental problems you see with most anglers who buy rigs, mm. who buy hooks to nylon, the hooks to nylon that long. And they put them on that long. Got a loop on, they mm. put them on that, exactly. Yeah. So they've got a lovely rig, mm. they've got a length of hook length like that, they can't put any shot on. No. It might only be that, that mm. deep, but it spoiled the whole rig. It's taken a long time to get it right, I'm really excited about these. Mm. We could use these rigs straight from the packet. It's hard coming up with ideas, new, innovative products, year in, year out. But when I've got the likes of Ian Dicker, Grant Albert and Steve Tucker on our side, they make it so much easier. You see we've got some great new products this year. Don't forget to check out all our products in your local Galwino stockist or on our website. Have a great season.